Good evening. My name is Dr. Meredith Mayo, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Karen. Tonight I'll be speaking about how to relieve shoulder pain, specifically regarding pain and injuries surrounding the rotator cuff and arthritis that can develop either in addition to or instead of rotator cuff pain and or injuries. So again, I work at Boulder Center for Orthopedics and Spine. We have locations both in Boulder as well as in Lafayette. This will be a little bit of our outline this evening for how we are going to approach shoulder pain. The most common causes of shoulder pain that are degenerative in nature that we see in adults include rotator cuff tendinosis slash impingement. And that's a spectrum of an inflammatory uh, process throughout the rotator cuff and surrounding the rotator cuff that we'll go through in detail. Then we'll move on to rotator cuff tears, which involves actual tearing of the tissue. And then we'll move on to osteoarthritis of the shoulder. And again, as I mentioned, that can occur with or without rotator, ro rotator cuff tearing. Excuse me. And lastly, we'll move on to what can happen when you've had a rotator cuff tear for a long time, whether or not you've known it which is a specific form of arthritis called rotator cuff arthropathy. Through each of these sections, we'll talk about how I evaluate and manage these, both with surgery and without surgery. And we'll review the surgical options for each of these, including rotator cuff debridement. And the word debridement refers to cleaning up or removing gently torn tissue, and then rotator cuff repair. We'll also talk about a newer procedure some of you may have heard of, which is something called a superior capsular reconstruction for people who have rotator cuff tears that cannot be repaired. We'll also talk about shoulder replacement surgery, both the straightforward anatomic total shoulder replacement, and then lastly, we'll touch on what a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is. For each of these sections, we'll also discuss what the recovery is like from surgery for these, which is a big deal here in our community when everyone is so active. To begin, we'll talk about the anatomy of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff consists of four muscles, and when I see patients in clinic, I'll explain this as well, but how I describe it is the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. The rotator cuff forms the equivalent of a shower cap or circumferential covering over the top of the ball or the humeral head, which allows you to rotate your arm through space. The shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body, and these four muscles work in concert together to allow us to have adequate shoulder range of motion while still have a stable shoulder joint. The four muscles include the supraspinatus, which is the rotator cuff muscle that is on top and in front, which you can see depicted here in this picture. The second is the infraspinatus, which is the muscle that's on the top and the back of the shoulder. We then move on to a muscle called the teres minor, which is located in the back on the bottom, and then the subscapularis, which is on the front and the bottom. Each of these has a truly independent function. The supraspinatus is the most commonly torn rotator cuff, in, rotator cuff tendon in our body. And what its muscle is supposed to do and why it's so frequently torn is it's the muscle that's responsible for you lifting your arm up away from your torso. The infraspinatus is the second most commonly torn tendon or muscle group in the rotator cuff. And what it involves is rotating your arm away from your body when your upper arm is against your side. The teres minor is the least commonly torn. And what it involves is rotating your arm when you're up like this, if you can imagine throwing a ball. Lastly, the subscapularis functions to internally rotate or move your arm toward your body. And it, it can be torn in addition to or in isolation to some of these other tendons. And you'll hear me refer to the word tendon. If we look at this picture, we can see this red muscle is what is indicated by the actual muscle belly. 
These are the fibers in our body that actually contract and expand to allow motion to occur. The white section that's between the red muscle belly and the bone is what the tendon is. Tendon connects muscle to bone. When we have rotator cuff tears that ultimately can require surgery, the surgery is usually addressed to reattach this tendon to the bone. So that was a lot of information for one slide, but we'll move on and revisit some of these issues and concepts in recurrent slides. So the first section we're going to refer to is rotator cuff tendinosis, which if you can think of it as a chronic inflammatory process, the tendon itself is intact, but very unhappy. And in addition to that, we'll talk about something called impingement, which can truly add insult to injury in the case of an inflammatory uh, tendon. So this is the most common cause of shoulder pain. And what it causes is external compression on the rotator cuff. We've also heard the term bursitis. So this whole spectrum of impingement, bursitis, rotator cuff tendinitis, they all go hand in hand. Your physician, provider, physical therapist may refer to them in different ways, but those three things together all go hand in hand. So when we talk about the subacromial space, if you see on this slide, you can see this red angry tissue irritated by this bracket. The subacromial space refers to the space above the humeral head but below the acromion. The acromion is a bony projection of our shoulder blade as it wraps around the body on the side. It's that shelf of bone you can feel if you take your hand and push on the top of your shoulder. Between that humeral head or ball of the shoulder and the acromion lives your rotator cuff. So you can imagine when you go to lift your arm out to the side, you are decreasing the space between your arm bone and the acromion, which can then cause impingement or pinching. That pinching in isolation can be very painful. It can also cause a buildup of inflammatory fluid or tissue called bursa or bursitis. And lastly, it can cause inflammation within the rotator cuff tendon itself, even though the tendon is still attached to bone. So altogether, these things can produce a chronic inflammatory state. And now we'll talk about how people present when they have these. So when I see people in my office who have this, their most common history includes shoulder pain on the side. They'll grab the side of their upper arm. And occasionally, they'll point to the front as well. They have difficulty with overhead activities. Imagine reaching up to put a plate away, or even overhead sport activities like rock climbing. They'll also have challenges with reaching far away from their body or behind their body. The most frequent thing I hear is, it hurts when I reach in the back seat when I'm in my car. The difference and key that I'm listening for when I meet patients and they're describing their discomfort is you've noticed I haven't mentioned anything about weakness. While this is very painful, patients should not have weakness from this set of inflammatory processes, and that's because the rotator cuff tendon is still attached. This can usually occur in slow onset, meaning over time it gets a little bit worse, a little bit worse, and a little bit worse. Alternatively, it can come on rapidly if patients are either trying a new activity and their shoulder mechanics are not prepared for it. I've seen a lot of people pick up pickleball during COVID, and a lot of people have had shoulder pain from pickleball. Now you can imagine picking up any new activity could cause new shoulder pain if your shoulder's not prepared to appropriately perform that activity. It can wax and wane, so people can have good days or bad days. They can go weeks at a time without having shoulder pain, and then they can come in and say, you know, I went back to playing pickleball, pickleball after leaving it off for four months, and then it came right back. When you come in with shoulder complaints like this, I'll initially start with obtaining a set of x-rays. And x-rays are helpful for a number of reasons. But x-ray primarily only shows us bone. 
And you remembered when I started explaining what the rotator cuff was, it's not bone. So I cannot see your rotator cuff on x-ray, but it, what it does do is give me information about your bone structure, your shoulder joint, and the overall bony alignment and space relationship between your bones around the shoulder. So if we look at this picture in the upper right, this is looking straight on at the shoulder. You can see the arm bone as was previously depicted in our uh, animation. And then you can see at the top it forms a ball that sits in the socket. That is your shoulder joint. You can see the rib cage next to that. And if you can imagine at the top of the rib cage, that's where your head would be. We can also see that above the ball and socket joint, you have a shelf of bone that comes across. And again, we see this space between the shelf of bone and the top of the ball. Again, that is where the two most commonly torn rotator cuff uh, tendons, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus live. So the amount of space between that shelf of bone on top and the ball can give me some clues about whether or not you're at risk or prone to having rotator cuff pain. These two pictures on the bottom are looking at your shoulder directly from the side. So if you can imagine someone was looking straight like this at the side of your arm with your arm against your body, that gives me more specific information about the acromion. Again, the acromion is that shelf of bone that wraps around the side. And often people can develop a bone spur or hook on the undersurface of the acromion that can then decrease the space between the top of the ball and the bottom of the acromion, thus decreasing the amount of space you have for your rotator cuff. So again, even though I can't see your rotator cuff on x-ray, we can glean a lot of very important and helpful information about it that can help guide us in the future. One more thing, if we go back to that first x-ray in the top right corner, we can also see that the ball is well centered in its socket. The rotator cuff functions to hold that ball down in the socket. We'll see some x-rays later when we're talking about different abnormalities in the rotator cuff when the rotator cuff has lost its function and that ball starts to move out of the socket. So our physical exam, I've already depicted some of these, and they're very similar positions of the shoulder or arm that people will uh, complain bother them at home. And so honestly, when you come into the office, what I'm trying to do to evaluate if your rotator cuff is the source of your pain is to try to pinch that rotator cuff on top and reproduce some of that inflammatory pain. So what the most common mechanisms that we do in the office to do this is as you can see in this bottom left cartoon, someone will put their hand on the top of the shoulder and then either move your arm for you or you can move it and bring it up like this. If that reproduces pain, that's a good guide to whether or not your rotator cuff is being pinched. Additionally, if we bring your arm out to the side and rotate it in like this, that decreases the amount of space between the acromion and the humeral head, thus also pinching the rotator cuff. Go back to this slide one more time. Again, remember, we'll talk about strength testing later. I'm not touching on strength testing here because patients with this do not have weakness. So our initial course of treatment for this condition and spectrum of inflammatory processes around the rotator cuff includes non-operative management. And this should be fully exhausted before you consider stepping into the surgical options. So the first line of treatment is a class of medications we refer to as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, most commonly known as things like Aleve, Advil, ibuprofen. There are other forms that you can obtain in a prescription variant that are sometimes a little bit easier for patients to manage. But in general, uh, you can manage this with over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications. That being said, most people don't take them on a structured prescription level dosage or basis, and so we can sometimes help guide people on how to manage these over-the-counter medications even if they don't want to try a prescription version. The next step generally includes either a combination of a home exercise shoulder program that we can help arrange for you, or, in my preference, is meeting formally with a physical therapist. 
The reason is, even if I show you how to do a set of exercises in the office one time, we're not gonna have the opportunity to repeat them or go through them multiple times, and certainly not once your shoulder is starting to fatigue and be uncomfortable. Alternatively, the physical therapist can truly verify that you are doing exercises correctly with the appropriate form, doing them for the correct duration or repetition. In addition, doing them in a manner that will improve your overall shoulder function, and they're able to alter or adjust exercises for you if you have discomfort or are ready to move on to the next step. They also have the ability to add in things, what I refer to as modalities. So I think of physical therapy in two categories. One is exercise related, and the other is something called modalities. So again, I remember I mentioned the shoulder's the most mobile joint in the body. When the shoulder starts to hurt, certain muscles get weak, certain muscles get excessively tight and do what we call spasm. And physical therapists can help break that spasm process either with manual therapy such as massage, they can do things that are more stimulating to the muscle either with an ultrasound machine or something called dry needling. And these things can be very helpful for people to break this pattern of shoulder uh, mechanics that are a little bit off and get ready to move forward. Additionally, you'll talk to patients about modifying their activities. So things that are very hard on the rotator cuff and shoulder in general are any repetitive overhead activities, whether that's through your job. Electricians have a very hard time with rotator cuff abnormalities and pain. In addition, if you were a lifter or rock climber, so many people are in this community, um, sometimes we have to modify the way that you lift or your climbing mechanics, and we and the physical therapist can work with you on this as well. Lastly, I reserve a corticosteroid injection, which is an injectable form of anti-inflammatory medicine for people who simply aren't progressing the way that we would hope or expect that they would. This steroid injection is really reserved to help people get over severe inflammatory pain so that they can sleep more comfortably at night and also be comfortable enough to do and participate um, in the physical therapy exercises and regimen. So you say, well, all of this sounds great, no surgery. Well, it doesn't work for everyone. You know, sometimes people's bony anatomy with that undersurface of the acromion diving down in a big spur no amount of physical therapy can overcome that in some people. And so I generally offer surgery for pa patients with this spectrum of rotator cuff inflammation, bursitis, impingement, for people who have tried over three months of therapy without adequate improvement. And what that surgery involves is something called shoulder arthroscopy. Shoulder arthroscopy is a minimally invasive surgical approach to the shoulder. And what it involves is anywhere from three to five small incisions less than a centimeter in size that allow me to insert a camera within your shoulder and look under direct visualization at your shoulder's mechanics. I can move your shoulder with the camera inside. I can repair things. I can, in this case, for this abnormality, remove that extra bone spur above the rotator cuff. If you've built up inflammatory tissue that can't be helped by any amount of Advil or Aleve, I can remove inflammatory tissue. It's extra tissue. That's what we call non-structural, meaning it has no benefit for you, it's just causing you persistent pain. The advantage of this is that the recovery is very quick because we're not asking any tissue to heal apart from your surgical incisions. In my practice, you have essentially no restrictions right away. I do get you back into physical therapy to verify that you have appropriate shoulder mechanics after surgery, but people are back to almost all activities within six weeks. So now we're gonna move on. We're gonna kind of work in a sequential manner. So the first step was no tearing or involvement of damaged tissue, it was inflammatory. Now we're gonna step into the spectrum of rotator cuff tearing. And there is quite a spectrum within how the rotator cuff and to what degree the rotator cuff can be torn. So this is a big and expensive problem in our country, and it's one of the most frequent surgeries that I do in my practice. Rotator cuff tearing affects about 17 million people in the US each year. It compromises 4.5 million physician visits a year, and about two 
to 300,000 rotator cuff tears are repaired every year. There's evidence in our orthopedic literature that the complication rate can be anywhere from 5 to 15 percent. I think we're getting a lot better at addressing some of those complications, but the most frequent complication is definitely failure of the repair. So our research in orthopedics is really focused on how can we decrease the failure of a surgical repair of the rotator cuff and uh, keep you from having to have a second surgery. If we look at this picture on the right, and you can see this red circle, this is depicting that rotator cuff tendon on top fully being torn off the bone. That tissue in that small, dark, irregular circle is, shouldn't be there. That tissue should be smooth and against the bone like the other white tissue you see in that square. And again, if we look at the bottom picture, this is another reminder of the rotator cuff anatomy. And again, in this picture, muscle is red, and then the white tendon or rope connects the red muscle to the tan bone. Again, here we see the bracket that says rotator cuff tendons. And again, the tendons of the rotator cuff that are most frequently torn are the two tendons on top. So now we'll move into the kind of history or presentation when you come to the office and talk to your physician or provider about why your shoulder hurts. We want to know why in this case. It makes a very big difference for how rotator cuff tears are managed. So I kind of classify this into two groups when I meet someone. One is, did you have an injury? And that doesn't mean that you necessarily fell off a 20-foot ladder, although unfortunately sometimes it can be that. But it can even be as little as I was walking my dog, I tripped, I caught myself with my arm outstretched. Falling on an outstretched arm when your elbow is locked straight transfers all that impact through your shoulder and thus your rotator cuff. And we know that that can be a common mechanism for tearing your rotator cuff. The other thing we see frequently is injury from lifting a heavy object overhead. So again, this really impacts our manual labor population who are so frequently lifting. And often, I have to say, during COVID, so many of our lovely uh, postal service and Amazon workers who have helped us survive for the last year. If you've had a major trauma, like a fall off a ladder, you actually can hear a pop. Some patients have presented to my office saying, I fell, I heard something tear, it was the worst sound of my life, and now I'm here. That's a major red flag. The last thing that's very concerning after a traumatic injury to a shoulder is if you've actually lost range of motion in the shoulder, meaning even if you are not having pain, you cannot lift your arm. You cannot rotate your arm. If you're having loss of shoulder function that is independent of your level of pain, that's very concerning to me. So that's our traumatic rotator cuff tearing symptoms. The second section is people who have had slow degeneration of their rotator cuff over time. And this can happen in a similar pattern to our presentation I described earlier of the inflammatory state, except in this case, these people have weakness in addition to pain. So it may be, it hurts when I reach in the back seat of my car, but I also can't lift up to get a plate out of the uh, cabinet in the kitchen. These patients also have a lot more pain at night. Sleep is one of the main things that drive, or I should say lack of sleep, is one of the main things that drives people in to actually get treatment. And then lastly, difficulty with daily activities. People who've had these for a long time can have difficulty combing their hair. If you're a woman, a common complaint is difficulty fastening their bra, uh, things like that. Very simple things that we take for granted on a daily basis can become very challenging for people. Risk factors for having a significant rotator cuff tear without an injury include being over the age of 60, particularly over the age of 65, using tobacco products, and being diabetic. There was a very, very interesting study now done about 10 years ago where we got MRIs of people, thousands of people, of their shoulder, whether or not they had shoulder pain. And I tell people this all the time in the office. At the age of 65, whether or not you have shoulder pain, you have a 50% chance of having a complete, meaning the tendon is completely torn off the bone. 
50% chance at the age of 65, whether or not it bothers you. What that tells me is that biologically with time, this tissue is degenerating and starting to not be able to accommodate our everyday activities. So again, like our last series, the x-rays are often normal in these patients. So again, in this case, physical exam, I'm more focused on, well, what is your strength? You may have pain, but I'm really more concerned about your strength if you've had a really traumatic injury. So for people with very massive tears or very acute or recent tears, sometimes they can't lift their arm over their head. They'll start to lift their arm and then they'll, they won't be able to and they'll start to just lean their back back to compensate for lack of shoulder motion. Alternatively, I can lift their arm up for them, but they won't be able to hold it even against the force of gravity and it will drop. That's what's depicted in these two pictures on the bottom of the slide. Lastly, they'll have weakness. So I'll have people bring both their bothered and normal arm out like this, and I'll frequently push down to test the supraspinatus strength. And I kind of use your uninjured arm as an internal control to see what your normal strength is and gives me a good measure of how much weakness, if any, you may have. So my main, if there's any take home point from this lecture, I would say that traumatic shoulder injury should be evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon. Rotator cuff tears that have been neglected for a long time can become much more complicated both for patients but also for surgeons. So if you have an injury to your shoulder and you are at all concerned, you should be evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon or an orthopedic practice. And the way that we do this from an imaging perspective is remember I said the x-rays are frequently normal and only show us bone. At this point, if I'm really worried about a rotator cuff tear, I'll order something called an MRI without contrast. This is a magnet-based three-dimensional imaging system that gives me information about the soft tissues within the shoulder, particularly the rotator cuff. It also gives me good information about the cartilage or joint surfaces that go over the humeral head or the ball and socket and can let me know if there's any uh, arthritic component as well. So when we start talking about conservative treatment for rotator cuff tears, it's only appropriate for some populations. So if we get an MRI and let's say you only have 20% tearing of the rotator cuff, anything less than 50% tearing of one of the rotator cuff tendons, it is safe to attempt to manage that conservatively. We know that when the tear compromises more than 50% of the tendon attachment, our research would suggest that by and large, people do far better with surgical management than prolonged physical therapy. Conservative treatment or non-surgical treatment is also appropriate for some people, particularly over the age of 65, who have what we call chronic tears, meaning they never had an injury, they just came in because they've had six months of shoulder pain and we find in their MRI that they have in fact had a rotator cuff tear for some time. And again, our non-surgical treatment algorithm is essentially the same. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, activity modification. Again, reserving that steroid injection for people who are truly only having so much discomfort that they can't sleep at night or cannot participate in physical therapy. Which rotator cuff tears need surgery? Traumatic complete tears. So if we look at this picture on the right, again, we see this jagged edge on this white tendon structure and it is completely torn off the bone. That is what I, when I refer to a complete tear, that means 100% of the tendon has been torn off the bone. Other patients that get funneled into surgery are people who have persistent weakness or loss of function despite going through physical therapy. And same thing with pain. If people are having persistent night pain or pain with activity despite our conservative treatment algorithm, we'll talk about surgery. What does surgery entail? For a traumatic or recent tear, what it involves is stitching the tendon back down to the bone. And we can see in this kind of sequence of pictures on the right, as we go down, we're gonna go from top to bottom. And this is how you arthroscopically repair a rotator cuff tear. So you can see in this first picture at the top, 
that there's an arrow pointing to the torn tendon. We've seen that a number of times now in these pictures, but what that is is the tendon actually being torn completely off the bone. In this second picture, as we work our way down, we see that there is a, a long metal instrument going into the shoulder. That's an arthroscopic shaver. And what the shaver does is cleans up the torn tissue edges to make it ready to be repaired. It also prepares the bone. So a, a good component of a rotator cuff repair is exposing the bone marrow to the repair site. So we do remove that top sh very thin layer of bone so that you have exposed bone marrow which can then deliver healing cells to the tendon and it can stitch itself back down to bone. This third picture on our way down, the largest picture in this sequence, shows how we actually get that stitch or material to pull the tissue back down to the bone. So when I explain this to people in the office, I refer to these repair anchors as drywall anchors. They're made out of a dense calcium-based material. They're far and large non-metallic. I do not use metallic anchors, but the advantage of these drywall or calcium-based anchors is that ultimately our body resorbs them and replaces them with normal bone of a, over a period of two to five years. You can imagine if you had a screw and it had stitches coming out of it like hairs, anywhere from two to four stitches come out of these anchors and what we do as surgeons is then pass the ends of these sutures through the tendon and pull it back down and tie it back down to the bone. If you look at this bottom picture, you can see that that tissue is now tight back down to the bone and secured. For chronic rotator cuff tears, this can work as an option, but if the tissue has been torn off for a long time or is very large in nature, sometimes we need to do things called augmentation or added uh, grafts to help the tissue heal back down to the bone. There are multiple ways to go about that, um, and there are multiple options in our market, but the goal of them is to improve cellular biology and strength so that your tissue can heal back down to bone. The last thing that we can do in people with chronic very large tears is do something called a superior capsular reconstruction. And what that involves is actually taking outside tissue, uh, non-human tissue, it's what we call a xenograft or from an animal, and it attaches deep inside the shoulder socket and then goes all the way over the humeral head or the ball almost like recreating the shower cap that the rotator cuff looks like. And what that does is improves our shoulder biomechanics and makes up for our rotator cuff not being able to be attached. People always ask me, oh, if I have this surgery, what is my life gonna be like? Am I out of commission forever? And the answer is no, but the recovery is slow, long, and boring. So the first one to two weeks is not fun, but I will say at the two week mark, 99% of my patients are not taking any pain medication. They're feeling much better. And then we get them into physical therapy starting at two weeks after surgery. In addition to being in physical therapy, at the beginning, however, you are also in this sling as depicted in the picture for four to six weeks total, depending on the size of your tear. What this does is prevents you from actively moving the shoulder either away or rotating away from the body and preventing stress on that repair that we just did. The process of the tendon healing to the bone to the extent where we can do activities with essentially no restrictions takes three months or 12 weeks. So at the six week mark after surgery, I see you check in on the progress that you've made with physical therapy, let you get rid of the sling. Many patients have ceremonial burnings because they do not enjoy it. But in general, people are, are happy to get out of the sling and start progressing their range of motion. So from week six to 12 after surgery, you can move your arm however you feel comfortable, but you still cannot lift anything in that arm, no more than one pound. I generally tell people no more than a cup of coffee. And then at that three month mark, people start getting back into their activities. That process usually takes four to six weeks, 
but the full recovery, I tell patients, is six months. And even at six months, there may be things where you say, oh, I'm playing pickleball, and when I really get to that extreme motion, I still feel a twinge. It's not severe, it's not terrible, it's not debilitating, but you'll have a reminder here and there, even at six months. We know from our research that people continue to improve from this surgery from up to uh, from six months up to two years after surgery, but at six months, 95% of your function, if not more, should be back. So now we'll move on to the third part of this, which is a little bit outside of the rotator cuff, but unfortunately people can have rotator cuff and this at the same time. And when I think about the most common shoulder issues in the adult population, arthritis is definitely one of them. So now we're gonna talk about glenohumeral osteoarthritis. Glenohumeral simply refers to the ball and socket joint I've showed you in a number of pictures, and arthritis I think we're all familiar with. It's essentially wear and tear of our joint surfaces uh, to the point where we have consistent daily debilitating pain. So people with arthritis present in the office in a slightly different manner. They have a slow loss of range of motion. Some people come in and don't even have pain, but just can't move their arm. They're literally just stiff. And the difference between that and the rotator cuff patient is, while a rotator cuff patient with a really bad tear can't lift their arm, but I could lift their arm if I took their arm and lifted it myself. In someone with severe arthritis, nobody's moving their arm. They can go to there, I can take their arm, but it can't go any farther. The simplest way to think about arthritis is you have a square peg in a round hole. You have a true mechanical block to progressing that motion. This is what we call wear and tear arthritis, meaning, meaning it happens over time. People can notice audible popping and true grinding sensations with shoulder motion. Um, they have a deep, aching, constant pain. Uh, most patients who present also have a very consistent component of night pain, not necessarily keeping them up in a severe way, but just constant pain when they lie down to go to sleep. Unfortunately, some people can be kept up all night from shoulder arthritis. What are the risk factors for shoulder arthritis? Well, unfortunately, there are a few. Um, one is throwing athletes. So we know, and we're getting better and better about educating our young athletes about this, um, but at least when we start to see 50, 60 year olds who said, oh, I threw, threw the baseball from the day I could walk until I finished high school. That alters your shoulder mechanics for the rest of your life. When you're doing throwing sports throughout your childhood when your bones are developing and growing, it truly alters your mechanics and you're loading your joint that whole time which can put you at risk for arthritis. Secondly, I've touched on our manual laborer population. Um, they constantly lift repetitive heavy loads on a daily basis in what we call non-functional or non-anatomic positions. So we are not meant as human beings to lift 100 pounds over our head 20, 50 times a day. We are not meant to do that. Um, so electricians, um, plumbers, people like that, uh, people who work for the postal service, again, thank you. But yes, you're at risk for developing shoulder arthritis. Another class of risk factor is something called rheumatologic disease. So rheumatologic disease is a fancy term for referring to people who unfortunately have a genetic or congenital risk for developing what's called inflammatory arthritis. These are things that you hear people of saying, I have rheumatoid arthritis, I have lupus. There's a huge family of these rheumatologic or inflammatory arthritic conditions that attack our good cartilage in our shoulder and cause it to break down. Another thing that we see frequently is people who've had a dislocation of their shoulder. So sometimes people say, oh, I dislocated my shoulder once when I was 19 being dumb and doing something I shouldn't even tell you about. And then they'll say it was fine for 20 years, come in and they have full-blown shoulder arthritis. Well, that's, that can definitely put you at risk. And we also know if you've had a prior shoulder dislocation, it does not matter if you had surgery or did not have surgery for that dislocation, purely by dislocating you are at risk for developing arthritis. So the last risk factor is if you have a fracture or broken bone to the top of the arm bone or humerus uh, near the ball that involves the joint. And again, we're at risk for this whether or not we have surgery for it. 
These x-rays on the right depict a uh, what we call humeral head fracture or fracture of the ball section of the humerus on the top. And then on the bottom, that's how we fix those fractures. And that's an excellent fixation with good anatomic alignment, but again, we're still at risk for arthritis. So x-rays, as opposed to the uh, rotator cuff spectrum of injury, Arthritis x-rays are extremely helpful for surgeons. Um, we get multiple views. I usually get four views that let me look at the joint from different angles and help me determine if you have mild, moderate, or severe osteoarthritis. Oftentimes, when we get into discussing surgery for these patients, we'll start looking at MRIs and or CAT scans. Again, MRIs give us three-dimensional information about the soft tissue and cartilage structure in the shoulder. CAT scans are really three-dimensional information about the bone structure that can truly assist in surgical planning for potential shoulder replacement surgery. So, this is that same x-ray we looked at before, one of the first x-rays we saw tonight. The image on the left is a normal shoulder x-ray looking straight on. And this is what we call an AP or anterior to posterior view. Look at that picture on the left. Everything's nice and happy. The ball's very round. The socket's nice and happy. Look at that picture on the right. We can see here that the ball is starting to have an irregular surface. There's no space between the ball and socket. We can also see that there are dark spots within the ball and dark spots within the socket. Those are called cysts. Those are very helpful signs on an x-ray because what it shows me is that the shoulder has received excessive force across the bone surfaces for a prolonged period of time. You do not develop cysts like that overnight. You do not develop this large bone spur, extra bone growth we see at the bottom of the ball in the picture on the right overnight. These things take time and they're all bony manifestations of your cartilage or joint surface wearing down and not being able to adequately transfer force across the bones. More pictures here. These are more for me than for you, but we're gonna go through it because we're talking about how I manage these. So this is looking at uh, the shoulder in a slightly rotated view that gives me more information about the specifics of the ball. So this is just a little bit of rotation, looks pretty similar to you guys, but for me it gives me extra information about the rotational component of the shoulder. This is that view we saw earlier when we were looking at the hook of the acromion as it dives down. This is a normal x-ray on the left. On the right, this lets me know if the ball is centered in the socket when I'm looking at it from this direction. Sometimes with arthritis, the ball starts to slip out the back of the socket, which can be a helpful indicator for how to manage these with surgery. This is a view called an axillary view. And what it is, is you would put your arm out like a chicken wing and the x-ray beam, instead of coming from straight on or side to side, would come from top to bottom. So you can imagine this is what I would call the cross section of the shoulder joint. So again, on the left, we're seeing the ball and the socket and there's space between the ball and the socket. On the right, the biggest difference is you can see that ball is right up against that socket and there is no cartilage or uh, smooth surface left between the bones. The MRI can give me different information. Uh, this picture on the left shows me the, how I described you can form cysts. These bright white circles within the bone on the left are cysts that we see. The MRI also lets me know if you have an intact rotator cuff. Like I mentioned, some people can unfortunately have both rotator cuff tearing and arthritis, and that affects how we manage them surgically. But most importantly, this also gives me uh, information about the socket. If we look at this picture in the middle, we can see that the socket is worn out with cysts as well. And then lastly, the picture on the right, really again, more uh, for me than for you in this case, but this just shows that the rotator cuff attachment is intact. So physical exam, we've got our history for shoulder arthritis, we've had our pictures. Now we're gonna again, always do a good physical exam. And like I mentioned, people with bad shoulder arthritis have range of motion that is limited in all directions or planes. External rotation, which is depicted here in this cartoon, when your arm is at your side and you try to go out, that is disproportionately lost in people with bad shoulder arthritis. Many people cannot do it at all. They'll come in and they'll be right here. Really, really bad arthritis. They can't even get to what we call a neutral position. And again, we talked about the noise and grinding with range of motion. So 
Initial conservative treatment for this is a little bit different and it depends on the severity of the arthritis. Um, but you can see this algorithm is essentially in the same kind of category as their other shoulder um, abnormalities. In this case though, we do use steroid uh, injections more liberally. Um, arthritis in general is an inflammatory process and the steroid can help really calm down that inflammatory process in people with mild to moderate arthritis and prevent them from feeling the pain of the arthritis. The steroid injection does not stop the arthritis, it does not reverse the process, but it can provide people enough pain control that they feel like they have an increased range of motion. I offer physical therapy for shoulder arthritis, but different than rotator cuff injuries, I do not push it much. So if people go to physical therapy and they say physical therapy hurts, we stop. And I say, okay, it's not worth it. Maintain your range of motion and strength at home. But it, remember I said arthritis is like pushing a square peg in a round hole. Physical therapy cannot compensate for that square peg and round hole. It, it can make up for all the muscles around that and optimize those, but if people are truly having that mechanical grinding and that's what's stopping them, physical therapy is not gonna be the answer. Anti-inflammatories, again, can be very helpful for this. Again, arthritis is an inflammatory process and a structured regular course of anti-inflammatories uh, can get people a long way. I've seen people who unfortunately have bad arthritis in their 40s and uh, want to wait to have surgery, which is totally reasonable, and even a structured course of Advil has helped them get five years of longevity out of their native shoulder joint. You know, I put this on here, and this is a big question mark in orthopedics in general. Uh, PRP or stem cell injections, what PRP is, it stands for platelet-rich plasma. And what that involves is taking your own blood, spinning it down in a system that then separates out the cell types, and then we can re-inject the... Um, cells that in our blood that have healing properties essentially and can stimulate healing. Same thing with stem cell injections. My general philosophy for this is it's an option for people with mild arthritis, um, but once the cat's out of the bag, which it usually is with this when people show up in my office, it's not worth your time, money, or effort to go through this. Unfortunately, the FDA in our country really limits our ability to manipulate human cells. So when you hear a lot of hype about PRP or stem cell therapies in our country, um, we're not able to produce the uh, concentration of these good cells to an extent that we can reliably help people. But it is an option, particularly PRP, for people who either absolutely do not want or are not able to have surgery. So lastly, when do you need surgery for shoulder arthritis? When you have pain despite all this exhaustive conservative treatment, or some people, again, don't have severe pain but truly just have loss of motion. And if people come in and say, I can't brush my teeth, I can't feed myself, I can't get dressed because my shoulder motion is so bad, that in my mind is a reason to consider shoulder replacement surgery. A simple option for mild to moderate uh, shoulder arthritis is something called comprehensive arthroscopic management. This is our best and least invasive way for people with mild arthritis to attempt to maintain and keep their native shoulder joint. Um, arthritis, and we didn't see this so much on the x-ray, I showed you a little bit of a bone spur, but sometimes bone spurs can break off and you can truly have a piece of bone floating around in your joint. It's almost like having a rock in your shoe. We refer to these as loose bodies. So sometimes arthroscopically, we can go in, release all the soft tissues around the shoulder to an extent that it allows your shoulder to move more. We can remove these loose pieces of bone or cartilage that have broken off. Um, we can stimulate the bone marrow within the, the joint itself by slightly penetrating that bone like I mentioned before. Um, and this again, because we're not repairing anything, we're not waiting for anything, uh, any tendon repair to heal, this is a quick recovery. So similar to that very first surgery we talked about, you're in a sling for comfort, you're in therapy to regain your range of motion, but you don't have restrictions immediately after surgery. The next step up from that, it really goes from the comprehensive arthroscopic management to a shoulder replacement. Shoulder replacements have been very well studied um, and we know that if you replace half the shoulder, meaning let's say you just replace the ball side, patients don't have a reliable outcome and ultimately generally require having a revision or second surgery. So a total shoulder replacement involves removing 
the ball and replacing it with a metal ball and placing a plastic socket on the socket side. If we look at the picture on the right, you can clearly see this white implant, which is indicated as being a metal structure, and that is the ball portion, and this one is a stemmed version. There are unstemmed versions for certain patient populations that are even less invasive, but in general, this hemisphere, you see the ball is replacing the worn out uh, native ball, and then what we cannot see on x-ray is uh, the plastic socket because x-ray doesn't show plastic. But you can see within the socket, you see one white line that depicts where that socket was centered. Uh, so this is what we call an anatomic or normal shoulder replacement. The post-operative course for this, so patients ask, do I have to stay in the hospital? No, you don't. You can go home same day from having this surgery. Oftentimes people do stay throughout the duration of the day, and then I always say, if you want to stay the night, stay the night. It's not a big deal. Whatever is easier for you. It can be a lot to manage for both not only the patient but family members as well. So having the option to stay overnight is nice, but some people are adamant they want to go home, and if we can do that, that's great. Uh, pain control-wise, going home is, is a very reliable uh, and safe option. Um, again, we do the sling with that pillow between your arm and uh, your abdomen for six weeks, and that's because to replace the shoulder, we have to separate some tendons, and then we have to let them repair. So we're doing our progressive physical therapy again for 12 weeks, very similar recovery as to uh, the rotator cuff repair. And then same full recovery at around six months. Again, we're gonna have twinges and things that may still bother us and we'll still have that continued improvement from six months up to two years after surgery. So this last section, we're gonna keep this quick. This is the most complicated and also least frequent to be honest. This is called rotator cuff arthropathy. This is a form of arthritis that occurs when you've had a chronic rotator cuff tear that has been going on so long and is so severe that it truly alters the way that your shoulder mechanics work. It alters that ability to keep the ball in the socket and the ball starts to migrate or move upward from the socket so you don't have the same joint mechanics that we do in a normal shoulder. So, I get concerned for uh, this diagnosis when people come into the office and say, I've had a rotator cuff tear for a long time. Someone told me to have surgery 15 years ago and I couldn't do it because of work or I was scared, I didn't want to. Whatever the reason is, they didn't have surgery, they had a rotator cuff tear that they were told needed surgery and they didn't. Um, these people are concerning for having this form of arthritis. Some people come in and have a complete loss of shoulder function, something that I refer to as pseudo-paralysis. So they're not actually paralyzed, but they literally can't move their shoulder because the tendons are not attached that would allow them to move their shoulder. The other thing that we see sometimes is that people will come in and say, well, you know, I had a minor injury about 10 years ago. My shoulder hurt for a few months. I didn't do anything about it. And then all of a sudden, I went to lift up the grocery bag and my shoulder function went to zero. That's concerning that they may have had a bad rotator cuff tear in the remote past, even without injury. And finally, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. So what are the risk factors for these? This is again something just like with our rotator cuff degenerating with time, age is a risk factor for this. So age over 70, females are more at risk for developing rotator cuff arthropathy as well as again the classification of rheumatologic disease or inflammatory arthropathies. Imaging, same x-ray series. Um, it determines for me uh, what degree of bony change we've had from this chronically dysfunctional rotator cuff. And this does progress with time. I always get an MRI or CT scan for these patients depending on what the x-ray looks like. So this x-ray, if we look at this, uh, this picture on the left, you can see that that ball is no longer centered in the socket. That ball has moved up and is almost touching the acromion. Um, so that picture on the left alone tells me the whole story. You have no rotator cuff if you have this picture on the left. If you look at these two pictures on the right, these are more subtle but helpful for me when I'm doing my measurements in the office. Um, the picture on the bottom shows a more normal space between the acromion and the humeral head. You can see it's measured at 16 millimeters. Once we get below about six or seven millimeters, like this picture on the top, 
if you can imagine, that's not very tall. That, I mean, five millimeters is nothing. And that is showing that there's not even space for the rotator cuff. And we know that the radiographic or x-ray evidence of having that decreased space of six millimeters or less essentially means that your rotator cuff cannot be attached to the bone. So these are more pictures looking from other angles, not in this case as helpful as those two pictures I just showed you before. The MRI tells me, again, a lot of information. I like the MRI for rotator cuff arthropathy because it gives me all the information I need about the rotator cuff. And then it also tells me about the ball and socket. So I really, in this picture, want to focus on the uh, one in the top right. You can see that we see the ball and the socket. The ball is moving up out of the socket. And there's no gray tissue between the top of the ball and that acromion or shelf of bone on top. That rotator cuff uh, tendon that we see, I wish I could point it to you, but uh, the rotator cuff tendon is that gray tissue that's above the socket. And I should see that going all the way across the ball and attaching. And in this case, it's pulled off, it's pulled back, and it is not attached. That tissue in this setting cannot be pulled back over and corrected. So exam is fairly uh, similar to things we've described for this. So very limited motion in all directions. That again, phenomenon of pseudoparalysis where people can't move, uh, but perhaps they uh, can move if I move their arm for them. That's what true pseudoparalysis is. We see in, these, in this picture of this gentleman, you can have actual wasting of the muscle in the back of the shoulder, and you can have bony prominence in the front of the shoulder as that ball starts to move up. Um, again, our conservative treatment pathway is essentially the same. Um, I would not even consider the um, biologic component or PRP or stem cells for this category. It would not be helpful. So again, same things for regular shoulder arthritis. When do you need surgery? Pain despite conservative treatment, progressive or debilitating loss of range of motion. And this is what a reverse shoulder looks like. And a reverse shoulder replacement is the appropriate treatment for rotator cuff arthropathy. You say, why in the world would you do that and what is it? A reverse shoulder is putting the ball on the socket side and the socket on the ball side. And what that does is it compensates for you having a deficient rotator cuff. You must have a functioning and intact rotator cuff to be able to have the first type of shoulder replacement we talked about, the anatomic shoulder replacement. So what this does is it recruits or uses other muscles in our body to make up for the dysfunctional rotator cuff. So post-operative course is essentially the same. The one thing we know about this, and we're getting less and less restrictive about this, is our implants get better and better, and we have more and more research. But with the older implant systems, we know that there was a progressive failure of reverse shoulder replacements with repetitive heavy lifting of over 15 pounds. Um, so we generally say, I tell my patients, don't repetitively lift more than 25 pounds overhead on a daily basis. So this isn't a perfect option for everyone, but it can be a great option and a last resort for a lot of people. So again, to review, this is that same slide we talked about at the beginning. Common causes of degenerative or adult shoulder pain, rotator cuff tendinosis slash impingement, that's that inflammatory category, rotator cuff tearing, arthritis, straightforward arthritis, and then rotator cuff arthropathy. We talked about how we'll chat and evaluate uh, each of these uh, diagnoses as well as how we'll initially manage them. In addition, we'll we talked about surgical options for each of these as well as their appropriate recoveries. So thank you very much. This is my family and husband, and we're so happy to be back in Colorado. Um, thanks again for listening to me this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayo. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have time for uh, one, possibly two questions, and okay. then uh, uh, people will need to direct any additional questions uh, via email to pr at bch.org. Okay. Um, so uh, does your practice accept Colorado Medicaid? That's a great question. Uh, we do see Medicaid patients who are appropriate for surgical intervention. We're happy to help community providers triage their Medicaid patients and help them uh, take care of these uh, patients, whether it's guiding them outside of our office through the physical therapy and conservative route, or if they need surgery, we can certainly work them into our office. 
I can avoid pain during the day by restricting motion. However, the pain while sleeping is intense. Can you repeat what I can do now while waiting for PT? Sure. Um, so someone who's having significant, and this again would depend on how old you are and if you've had any potential trauma in the past. Uh, but when I hear consistent severe night pain, I worry that either you have a significant rotator cuff tear or you have arthritis. And that's something where if we got an x-ray, we would be able to discern or determine which of those two it may be and how we would progress from there. Without having started physical therapy yet, I would get on a structured course of Advil or Aleve. Um, you can read the back of the bottle and you can take the maximum dose on the back of the bottle as long as your primary care doctor has told you that's okay. Thank you again for your time tonight and sure. all of the information, Dr. Maya. Great. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. Again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.